Hello, um, and uh, uh, thank you for joining me uh, in this exploration of uh, uh, some of the Moses themes from the Quran as uh, they occur in the works of Ibn al-Arabi. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure everyone can hear me well, and uh, I will uh, enjoy especially the time for discussion, and I will start with a riddle that occurs at the end of Ibn, of Ibn al-Arabi's treatise that's been translated recently by Angela Jeffrey and truly edited with extraordinary care um, by um, uh, Unca Press. Um, it's called uh, The Universal Tree and the Four Birds. Uh, and the work that went into this from Professor, uh, uh, from uh, Dr. Jeffrey and from uh, Denis Grin, um, the background is an example of what we've been talking about today, earlier, of uh, the community of knowledge uh, that has been involved in the rediscovery of Ibn al Arabi in, um, in the context of international scholarship over the past 20 or 30 years. The riddle uh, is uh, this. Walladi yafamu ramzi huwa sakhar bin sinan. Whoever understands my uh, allusion or my uh, clue, he is sakhar bin sinan. So I just want to keep that uh, riddle um, in the back of the talk, it's the riddle that closes uh, this treatise uh, that I mentioned. Could you read that again? Uh, whoever understands my riddle is Sakhar bin Sinan. Sakhar bin Sinan is uh, a name, um, and at the beginning of this treatise, um, Ibn al-Arabi says that I have written um, a, a richly embodied discourse here. Um, and then he says, he makes several authorial statements in, throughout the text. At one point he says, um, uh, I have addressed this book to Sakhar bin Sinan. At another point, he says, I address in this book only myself. At another po uh, a point, he says, and I said, and then the voice turns into uh, what uh, Rafi Zabor in the uh, beginning of the uh, preface to the book calls the tolling of polarities, where the voice is speaking as the high and the low, the cosmic and um, uh, uh, the earthly, uh, the lover, and the beloved. Uh, so one of the things that's clearly involved in this is work is a constant uh, reconstruction of the author and of the addressee. Who is speaking and who is being spoken to? The second aspect of this talk will be tracing uh, some of the same Moses themes that will appear in, in uh, this work, The Universal Tree and the Four Birds, in a few of the poems from the Tarjumadal Ashwap. And I, what I'd like to do now is start off by linking up and contrasting the experience that makes the Moses connection in Tarjumadal Ashwap with that re uh, involving Nizam that I talked about this morning. So with, uh, with that introduction in mind, I'd like to go into um, uh, the, uh, the account that Ibn al-Arabi gives of the, either this, another time of meeting with Nizam or meeting with another woman in the year 598 as he was uh, circumambulating uh, the Kaaba. Here's what he says. One night, 
I was circumambulating the Kaaba. Sweet was the moment. And I was overcome by an intense feeling that I'd known before. I left the area covered with paved stones out of consideration for the people there and continued my circumambulations on the sand. Some verses came to me and I recited them to allow myself and whoever might be around to hear them. I felt a soft touch. Oh, I'm sorry. Then he gives us the four verses that he recites. Um, we heard them last night, and I'll just read them in English uh, today. How I wish I knew if they knew whose heart they have taken or my heart knew which high ridge track they follow. Do you picture them safe, or do you picture them perished? The lords of love in love are ensnared and bewildered. He says, he, after he recited these poems, he felt a soft touch on his back between the shoulder blades the touch of a hand as soft as silk. And when I turned around, he says, there before me was a maiden from the daughters of the room, in Banat at room. I'd never encountered such a radiant countenance, such exquisite speech, such refinement of etiquette, such subtleties of meaning, such suppleness of illusion such wit in repartee. She exceeded her entire generation in intellect, adab, and beauty. She said, Master, what was that you said? And I recited the first, and he, then he recites the first verse. I wish I knew if they knew whose heart they have taken. And she says, what a strange thing for one like you to have said, you being a Gnostic of your age. Is not everything that is possessed known? And is there any possession except as a consequence of knowledge? The path is uh, the tongue of sincerity how is one like you to traverse it? Um, the word for one like you is mythlika. Then she said, what was the next thing you said? And he recites the second verse. And she launches into an even more stinging critique with the same end refrain about the, um, the path is the tongue of sincerity. At the fourth uh, verse, she... Um, she exclaims the following. Amazing. How could it be that the one pierced through the heart by love had any remainder of self to be bewildered? This was the verse about the lords of love being ensnared in love and bewildered. Love's character is to be all-consuming. It numbs the senses, drives away intellect, astonishes thoughts, and sends off the one in love with the others are gone, who are gone. Where is bewilderment, and who is left to be bewildered? And then she says, after the end of that, she also says um, that one like you uh, could traverse this path is... It's really not, uh, it's not seemly. And, and that he's uh, trying to attain the unattainable. He says, oh, my niece, a polite response to a, a, a young woman he doesn't know. What is your name? Kororet el Ain, she said. I said, Lee. 
that is in Arabic, li, I said to me. Now, this is a, a complicated pun. The name Khurrat al Ain is a name, but it's grounded in the story of Moses. And um, from the point of view of what's happening here, here is a um, uh, uh, well known scholar, Araf of his man, Gnostic of his age. He's circumambulating the Kaaba. He withdraws away from the center so that he, because he's going to recite these poems that came to him. A young woman appears, uh, her hand soft on his back. He turns around, they engage in this intense conversation. And she's telling him that he's, there's something really inappropriate about what he's uh, saying. And he asks her what her name is, and she says, Kuratelain, and he says, which is the softening of the eye, the misting of the eye, the comfort of the eye. It's a term for beauty and radiance. And he says, to me. And then he says, she, she bid farewell and, and went away. Um, now, um, I want to come back to this a little bit because I think there's a key to this in some of the early poems that come after this first poem in the Torjaman, a key to what is happening here. But as we recalled in the morning, Ibn al-Arabi says that he wrote his commentary on the Turjaman after a gentle, after some people criticized him for um, writing erotic poetry and pretending that it was really a, had had a religious message to it when it didn't. Um, so the, the critics were uh, were saying that what he was doing was in an, inappropriate, but clearly. Um, this woman from Banat al Rum, from the daughters of, of the Rum, is uh, not um, to be identified with these Fokaha. And yet it seems like she is challenging him on the point of etiquette um, quite strongly. And he, as he accepted throughout the teaching of various people, he responds to her challenge in quite extraordinary ways that I hope to allude to. Now let's, let me just turn to the Moses chapters uh, that are relevant. I want to cover the following themes in the Moses chapters of the Quran that Ibn al-Arabi uses very strongly in the two works I'm talking about. These themes are Qurrat um, al-Ain, the vision of the fire, the vo what the voice from the fire says, the inni ana, I, I. The blast of the mountain when Moses asks um, to see the face of God and, and the reply is look at the mountain and the mountain is blasted apart. Um, the casting down of the staff of Moses um, and it's turning into a snake. The casting down of the snaff, staff of Moses upon a rock, and it's bursting out with water. And the, the analogy the Quran makes to the casting of a staff on the human heart, some hearts uh, will burst with water and some will not. In the first one, um, let, let's talk about the Qurat al Ain passages first. And Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Wa laqad mananna alayka maratan ukhra. Is awhayna illa ummika ma yuha. Anakthavihi akthafihi fi tabuti. Fakthafihi fi yammi. This is um, an address to Moses, and it says, um, we have graced you with favor another time. When we revealed to your mother what was revealed, to throw him, that is Moses, into uh, a chest or a basket and to throw it into the river. And then he says that, um, it, the river will cast it up on the shore and it will be taken up by an enemy to him and to me. That is to God and to 
of Moses. Then it says, And I threw over you from me mahabba, love, so that you could be fashioned ala aini. So one of the key issues here is what is the complex play upon the word ain, qurratil ain, ala aini, ain being one of the most complex concepts in all of Ibn Larbi's thought. Then after um, the mother is returned um, to Moses in order uh, to nurse him, um, uh, the Quran says, uh, we returned you to your mother so that her eye can be soothed. And in another passage, um, when the, um, the wife of the Pharaoh uh, rescues Moses and says to him, we should take him. He will be a koratel ayn, a soothing of the eye, for me and for you. Li walak. So when Ibn al Arabi says to koratel um, ayn, li, it is a, a, a subtle allusion to that Quranic story. It could be. Um, uh, taken as a very kind of inappropriate kind of repartee, I am Khurratelain, well to me you sure are, and then she leaves like that. Um, but it's also clearly a reference to the Quran, in which case Ibn al Arabi is placing himself in the um, analogous situation of the mother of Moses um, or of the, of the life of the Pharaoh. And these kinds of gender reversals in Ibn al Arabi are very strong, and I think they're a really major part of his work. The second major theme in Ibn al Arabi's uh, thought that I'd like to talk about has to do with uh, the fire. Uh, Moses tells his people uh, that he sees a fire, or what appears to be a fire, he wants to go look at it. Perhaps he can. Uh, uh, gain an ember for the fire so that they could build a fire and warm themselves. And that fire then um, became, became a core concept uh, going back centuries in Arabic poetry. And at the time of Ibn al-Arabi, it was everywhere. And it, I think it was largely associated and got uh, bound up with Majnun Layla's fire. So uh, one of the most famous poems of Ibn, Ibn al-Farid, uh, one of uh, Ibn al-Arabi's contemporaries who, as I mentioned this morning, his poems and Ibn al-Arabi's poems relate so strongly to one another, and they were probably in Mecca at the same time. It leads to extraordinary questions about whether they knew of one another's poetry in their lives. Helnaru Leila Bedet Leilan Bedi Salami has the fire of Layla um, appeared in the cell, um, or has uh, uh, a lightning appeared in Zawra and in El Alam. And um, these, uh, this notion of a fire appearing or a lightning appearing and the key concept of, of alaha, this word that we have in English that says appear, did a fire appear? But I find in early Arabic it has such a stronger connotation than the contemporary word in English appear. It has the connotation of an apparition. That is something that takes over, that comes into view, that you're, you're not sure uh, if you really see it, then you're not sure ex if it can be real, uh, but it is actually in many ways more than real. And uh, this is the concept that um, I think Ibn al-Arbi uses uh, very frequently in his, his love poetry. 